This video is sponsored by Policy Genius. Hey, welcome to part two in our built in cabinet video series. In the last video, I showed you the construction of the entire cabinet and we got to this point in the build and then I cut the video off. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to break this all down, get it painted, get it put back together, installed in the house and looking fancy. So, watch the video, subscribe down below, do all that other stuff I told you about, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, you know all that stuff. Oh, and check the video description for tools and parts. Yeah, in the video, tools and parts in the video. Play the video. White snow, red sky, reach up for so, so high. Well, since we left off last video getting this whole thing put together, it only makes sense that we start this video by tearing it all back apart. That's right, after we get everything fit just the way we want it, we take it all apart so that we can paint it. I start by taking off the drawer faces and numbering each one. I also number the drawer box so I know which face goes with which box. Then I like to take a piece of tape, cover up the number on the drawer face so that when I paint it, I can still see it. After I get the drawer boxes and drawer faces off, I take off each cabinet door. You also want to make sure to label these appropriately. You spend a lot of time getting them aligned perfectly, so it's going to be a lot easier if you put all the hinges and doors back in the same place. So I start by taking hinges out and labeling each hinge. There are four different sections of door hinges, so I just label them 1LB for section 1, that's 1 left side bottom, and I do the same on the door itself. Then I stick a little piece of tape over the label on the door, because like I mentioned, we're going to paint these, and you don't want to paint over your freshly labeled door and not be able to find it again. I also take the time to label each piece of glass. This probably isn't as important, all the glass is identical, but I'm just kind of OCD, so that's how I roll. Speaking of roll, who's that guy rolling around in the background? What a weirdo. And then I go through and I pull off every single drawer slide. You don't need to label these. They literally are all identical, so you could put them back any which way you want. Just make sure you have help while you're doing this so you don't have to lift anything heavy. That's what children are for. Then if you remember from our last video, we never actually attached our face frame because we wanted to make it very easy to install this beast. So then you can go ahead and pull your face frame off as well. Then finally, you can remove all of the shelves. Gosh, that guy just keeps popping up. And set them aside to be sanded in just a minute. And then lastly, lastly, is that a real word? I think so, it just sounds funny. Lastly, you want to remove all the screws holding the boxes together. There have definitely been a few times I forgot those screws were in there and just tried to pull the boxes apart and was like, oh yeah, dummy, you screwed them together. And of course you want to label each box so that it corresponds with all of your labeled parts and pieces. Now I should have done this step before I ever put the boxes together, but you want to add some pocket screws on the lower half of that bottom divider piece. This is just gonna give us a nice way to attach the face frame. We will tack it everywhere else and cover up those nails with our trim pieces. This is the only spot that we couldn't cover up with a trim piece, so just throw some pocket holes in there. And then we sand. And sand. Ooh, and sand, yeah, yeah. And then we move on to our shelves. Now, before I sand my shelves, we want a nice, smooth, seamless transition from that face piece to our plywood. So I take this Mohawk two-part epoxy putty, I smear it together, and I fill all the nail holes and the seam between the plywood and the face. And then I sand, and sand, and sand. I hate sanding. And with that, we are finally ready to start painting. The only problem is I don't have a paint booth. I don't have a paint room, it's pouring rain outside. So the only place I can paint is right in the middle of my shop. And I'm not gonna just do it on the floor and get paint all over my tools. 
So I am once again going to make a Dexter style kill room slash paint booth right in the middle of my shop and paint away. I start by covering the entire floor with a little of that ram board carpet, I don't know, cardboard stuff and I tape it down so it doesn't slide all over the place while I'm walking on it. Then I bought the cheapest plastic they sell at the paint store. It's just really thin mill plastic and I unroll the whole thing. This could have been a really bad idea. Anyways, once I get it unrolled, I just staple it to the ceiling. Not with any fancy staples either. I stole the stapler out of my wife's office and I just staple it right to the ceiling. The staples will just pull out when I pull the plastic down, so it really doesn't mess anything up. And then I just fold the plastic all down to create a nice little bubble where I can make the magic happen. And by magic, I mean kind of a mediocre job at spraying these cabinets. I'm not a great painter. I don't really know what I'm doing. I can get the job done, and I'll show you exactly how I do it, and sure it comes out good enough, but I'm sure if a painter were to watch this process, he'd say, whoa, bro, you're doing that all wrong. But I can only teach you what I know. And that's not much, but to spray these, I'll be using the Fuji Spray Q5 Platinum HVLP spray system. I'll be using the T70, T75, T70 spray gun with a 1.8 gauge needle. That's what I personally have found to work the best on latex paint. Is it right? I don't know, but it's what I use. Now I'm lazy. I mention that a lot, and because I'm lazy, I don't like spraying oil-based paint. I like going for water, so I spray a coat of this premium wall and wood primer from Sherwin-Williams, and then I love this emerald urethane enamel paint. It's super hard, super durable, and it actually sprays pretty good. I will say this, even if I don't know what I'm doing, I can sure look the part. Damn, I look good. All right, let's do this. Let's get some paint on these things. So, I like to start out just spraying a test piece. That seems like a logical thing to do. Make sure your gun's all the way it should be. Now, I heard that you want to have the gun pointed straight down, not at an angle, and you're just doing nice, light, even passes. I should also mention that I'm not spraying the paint straight out of the can. I thin the paint down about 10 to 15% just with water straight out of the tap. Now that's probably not right either, but it works great. You don't want too thick a paint or you're gonna get orange peel. You don't want too thin a paint or it's just gonna run all over the place and be a horrible mess. So 10 to 15% and just experiment around a little on a scrap piece. Find the mix that is laying down perfect and just go for it. Don't try and coat too much on there in any one pass either. Start out with just nice light passes you can come back and fill in with paint and do multiple passes. It's better to do multiple light passes than try and put it on too thick and deal with runs and splatter and drips and having to sand it down. And Anyways, just go easy. Patience. Patience. But all that being said, you can be a little more liberal with your primer because you will be sanding it down before you put actual paint on it. So just go heavy but not too heavy but not too light you know just make it look white <laughs> that rhymed a painting rhyme Woohoo! then after I've given all my primer a sufficient amount of time to dry I like to lightly go over everything with a piece of 220 grit sandpaper the primer has that water in it that likes to raise the grain so sanding it down will make it nice and smooth and ready for paint but before you put paint on you got to get all the dust off so I take a piece of tack cloth, I stretch it out as big as it'll go, as you can see here. It's kind of a pain because it's all folded over a zillion times. And then I wad it into a ball. This is the best method. You can use this one piece of tack cloth on all your boxes and it'll still be going strong. By wadding it into a ball, you get a lot more little surfaces that can pick up all the little pieces of dust. Then I mix up some paint. As you can see, this paint is pretty thin. I mix it again with about 10 to 15% water, and you don't want it thick and globby. That's just gonna make a horrible paint job. And then you do nice, light coats. You're gonna be doing multiple coats of the actual paint, so just start with a little. 
Now this is where my method probably deters from most people a little bit. I don't spray my face frame because we're gonna install this face frame after we get our cabinet boxes all situated. We are definitely gonna have to do a little touch up after we get our trim on, after we get it caulked against the wall. And if it's sprayed and we touch it with a brush, well, if there's any brush strokes, they're really gonna stand out. But if we just start by brushing the whole thing, touching up with a brush is just gonna be the same method that we started with. And you're never gonna be able to tell. Now there is a right way and a wrong way to brush. You wanna start by rolling on the paint with a foam roller and then tipping the paint with the brush. That means just lightly going over the top of the paint to pull all the air bubbles that the roller left behind out and making a nice, silky, smooth surface. Do that on every little part of the face frame and it will actually look pretty darn good. You're probably not gonna be able to tell that it was brushed. At least, nobody will be able to tell unless you say, hey, look really close. That's brushed and that's sprayed. But just don't do that. So after rolling and brushing the whole upper surface, I just go over the interior by hand with a brush. Then I come over and I check my paint job. It is nice and smooth, and we are not gonna sand in between coats at this point. Sanding could just mess it up and cause more cleanup. If it's smooth and glassy, just throw some more paint down. As you can see, with one coat of primer and one coat of paint, it's already looking pretty darn good. But I'm still gonna do about two or three extra coats of paint, because I'm crazy. So after doing that, not showing you because that would have been boring. My painting of my boxes and my drawer faces is done. So I pull all of my boxes out of my little spray bubble and we can move on to, yes, cabinet doors. You didn't think I forgot those, did you? I actually did forget that, but I'm watching the video while I voice this over, so I saw it and then I remembered. So then I, I made it seem like I hadn't forgot. So we put all of our cabinet doors and our shelves in our little spray booth. These are the last things that need to be painted. And once again, we coat everything with primer. Just nice and easy. I mean, if you kind of squint your eyes, I really do kind of look like I know what I'm doing. Maybe a little bit, at least. Anyways, you just paint everything that needs to be painted. I will say the cabinet doors are kind of a pain because all the little edges and nooks and crannies. And then finally, I paint a piece of quarter round that we will eventually use to trim out the bottom of the cabinet. This video was sponsored by Policy Genius. In today's world, stepping out your front door in the morning can be a little nerve wracking. You're literally taking your life into your own hands. Believe me, I know a thing or two about this. That's why it's so important to make sure you're protected with quality life insurance. But buying life insurance can be such a pain. That's where Policy Genius comes in. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace, not an insurance company. So you can get personalized quotes from top companies in just minutes. When you go to policygenius.com, the process is super simple. You just answer a few questions and you can save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. That's a big savings. You could save $1,300 or more per year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. So make stepping out your front door in the morning a little more fun and visit policygenius.com slash bourbon moth to shop the market and start saving today. All right, our carcass and face frame is all painted. So while we're waiting for our cabinet doors and shelves and everything else to dry, I can start installing the carcass and face frame. But before I do that, I wanted to address this hole in the wall here. Now, a few months ago, I was helping a friend remodel his house. We were tearing out some drywall, and in the drywall, in between the studs, we found this really old bottle. And in the bottle, there was a note, and it said, my name's Carl, I built this house. Okay, I thought that was pretty cool. Old bottle, note from the previous owner. So I wanted to do something similar. But as cool as Carl was, I thought he kind of missed an opportunity to do something really cool and make it a little more exciting for the next owner of the house. So I put together a little care package that I'm gonna put in the wall. Now, in this package, I have a half-drunk bottle of scotch with bloody fingerprints on it. I have 
a bloody steak knife wrapped in paper towels. Okay. I have a note with some random map coordinates on it with the words, liars sleep forever. I think the map coordinates are just to the middle of a field here in town. I've got three bags of mysterious white powder. This is just cornstarch, but <laughs> the next owner won't know that. And then I have a key. This is to my old storage unit that I don't own anymore. But to them, it'll just be a random key. So I don't know who's gonna find this bag, but I'll tell you what, it's gonna be a lot more exciting than that dumb note Carl left. So we'll just close this up, stick it in here, and maybe somebody will find it in a few hundred years. So before we can start bringing cabinet boxes and everything in, I had to clean all the junk out of the way. Now I will divert that outlet up into the cabinet box, but we'll wait till we get everything in place to do that. So I just start loading these cabinets in from my shop. It's nice that I work so close to the job site. I mean, that doesn't happen often. It's also nice that I built these in four separate pieces and not one giant 11 foot piece that I'd have to lug into the house. So I do one piece, two piece, red piece, blue piece. Anyways, I get all my pieces roughly in place and then I bring in my face frame. I just slide my face frame into place, stick it against the cabinet, make sure it lines up good on the end, make sure it lines up good on the other end, and we're done. That's it. Installed. Man, if only it was that easy. Now, first thing we have to do is get rid of this baseboard that was already on there. So I put a piece of tape on the face frame so that I don't get pencil marks all over that, and I transfer a line onto the baseboard to know where I have to cut it to fit the cabinet. And then I slide the face frame out of the way, nice and easy, and just using a little multi-tool, I cut the little three-quarter, oh whoa, that's bigger than three-quarter, chunk of trim out of the way and I slide the cabinet back into place. Then after doing that side, I slide all the cabinet boxes over, measure, and I do the other side, getting rid of that little piece of trim. These are just little pieces of trim because when I put the trim up, I knew eventually there was gonna be a cabinet here, so I just left it a little long on each side. Then I test to make sure that my face frame fits in there nice and tight, which it does. Now remember how I left that quarter inch piece on the back so I could scribe to fit the wall? Well, magically, the first time in the history of cabinet building, it just fits perfect. I didn't even have to scribe. Not only on that side, but on the other side too. This never happens. It's literally a miracle, but I'm not complaining. Now it is time to take our face frame out and actually hook our cabinet boxes together to make them one giant piece. So I start by clamping just each seam together with a few clamps, making sure that it is nice and tight and lined up. And then I use a few of these little trim head screws and I insert them in places that you're not gonna see. So in the bottom, in the top, right behind where the face frame's gonna go, and then I toenail one in the back because that's gonna be covered up with the top. So you're not gonna see that. You just don't want a bunch of holes inside your cabinet. That's what you're trying to avoid. And then miracle number two, it was perfectly level. I literally didn't have to put a single shim in this thing. What is going on? Nothing in my house is ever level. I have successfully found the one perfectly square and level corner in my entire house. Next, it is time to hook on our face frame. For that, I will be using this tight bond, quick and thick. I love this stuff for face frames because it doesn't run. It's thick enough that when you put it someplace, it just sits there until you stick a piece of wood against it. So I put a nice little bead on all of my exposed surfaces that the face frame will come in contact with. And then I slide my face frame into place, inserting it behind that piece of trim on the far left and making sure it is nice and tight on the far right. Now it's just gonna be glued into place on this corner. So I put a lot of clamps in there to get the seam nice and tight while the glue dries. Next, we are gonna tack it onto the top all the way across. 
That's gonna be covered up with a piece of trim that goes around the top, and we tack it on the bottom. That'll be covered up with a piece of cord around. And then we hook it in the middle with those pocket holes that we drilled under that little middle divider. I'm not gonna hook it on to the vertical divider pieces whatsoever. It's just gonna be pulled nice and tight against those, and the glue is gonna do its job. Next, we need to shim the back of the cabinet. Because we left that little quarter inch overhang, it is tight on that corner, but there's a quarter inch gap all the way along. So I stick a shim in there, I mark where it's nice and tight along the back of the cabinet, and then I insert the shim all the way along to make sure that it comes out the exact same distance as that far corner. Tap, 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 boom, boom, boom. Shim goes in. Darn it, I was trying to rhyme again, but I couldn't think of a good rhyme for boom, boom, boom. Then you find your studs and you attach the cabinets to the wall. I just use some screws right up at the very top underneath there. You're not going to see this unless you get down on your belly and look way up under there. And then I cut out a hole in the back of the cabinet to expose that outlet that I covered up. Remember that thing? And then to access that outlet from inside the cabinet box, I drill a giant hole in my freshly painted cabinets. What the heck did you just do? And then I vacuum up all the dust and I insert a nice little metal cord grommet to make it look all pretty. We like pretty. And by this time, my glue is dry and I can remove all my clamps off of that corner. It actually came together very nicely. No gaps in that seam whatsoever. That's the other nice thing about the quick and thick is that it really likes to fill in any voids. Next, it is time to get our top situated. Because this is an 11 foot built-in, I couldn't use one continuous piece of plywood. So we're gonna have to have a seam in the middle. But that's okay, I will show you how to make that seam disappear as if it was never there. Because that's what disappear means. So. You should already have known that when I said make it disappear. But anyways, I get my two pieces situated and where it comes together in that seam, you don't want just a butt joint. I cut each piece at a 45 so they can lap over each other just a little bit. This will make sanding them smooth much, much easier. As you can see there, it's an okay cut, but it's fine, it'll work. And then I attach the top to the cabinet just up from the bottom through those little brace pieces that run between each cabinet. And then before I hook the other piece on, I put a nice thick coating of that quick and thick glue on that seam that I can smush together and just make ooze out and fill all those little holes and gaps. Just like that. Then I clamp it down where I want it to be and I put a few screws in to hold it nice and firm. And then I take off my clamps. I feel like that's kind of obvious. It's not like you're gonna leave those clamps on there forever. And then I sand the corner of the face frame to make it nice and smooth. You just want to make sure not to wrap around the other side because the other side you sprayed. You just want to sand on the front where you brushed so that when you touch it up, you won't be able to tell. Of course, the foreman had to come over and make sure it looked okay. He approved, so I got on to making that seam in the top disappear. Again, I'm using that Mohawk two-part epoxy putty. I just smush it in there all along the crack and we'll sand that down later. Next, it is time to trim out the top. For this, I just cut some pieces of inch and three quarter poplar and I smear a nice bead of the quick and thick glue just along the top. That's the only place it needs to be glued and if you put it on the bottom, you risk it oozing out all over the face of your cabinet, which you do not want. And then I tack it in place, making sure that it is just a hair above the plywood. I mean like a 64th of an inch above the plywood. Just enough that we can very easily come back with the sander and sand it all down flush. So after tacking it on the corner, I just slowly work my way along that seam, making sure that, yeah, it's just barely sticking up. It's much easier to sand it off if it's sticking up than sand down the plywood if it's too low. You don't want it too low. After we do the front, we do our corner at a nice 45, and same thing, just barely sticking up. Just barely stick, okay, I'm done, sorry. And then I sand the whole thing smooth. Well, why don't you fill that crack? Well, we will, but it's much easier to fill after we sand it smooth, fill it, and then we'll sand it again. See, 
you fill that gap with all that mohawk two-part epoxy just smeared in there nice and good and if you do this right this will make that transition between your trim piece and your plywood top absolutely disappear once you paint it it'll just look like one continuous piece which is what we want and then finally before we paint anything i like to go around with a caulking gun i say caulking some say caulking but caulking is what i grew up saying and my mom would be blushing if i said caulking so you caulk all your seams and then i like to put some tape on that corner just to protect our sprayed side from getting any brush strokes on it and we just brush on a little primer on everywhere that we sand it down or any unfinished wood. We'll prime it, we'll sand it, and then we'll put our final coats of paint. Once again, we are using the rolling and brushing method. Remember, if you roll and then lightly brush over the top, you can really make all your brush strokes completely disappear. I mean, look at that. It looks, dare I say, perfect. I dare, it does, it does, it looks perfect. And then once it is primed and sanded, we paint everything. Because brushing and painting does put a little thicker of a coat on, you're probably good with just two coats of actual paint on top of the primer. Here's where you can see the rolling and brushing method in its prime. You roll on, it's okay if it's cross or forward or backwards, direction doesn't matter at all. Just get the paint on there evenly coated over the entire surface. Now you can see it's got a texture to it because of the roller. Part of that's the foam, part of that's the bubbles that the roller left behind. So once you get it on, you just do little sections at a time working your way along the top. This is my very last section on the top. Make sure it's nice and smooth. You feather it out kind of at the ends. Okay, we get it. It's enough rolling already. And then once it's all rolled, you take the brush and just using the very tip of the brush, barely putting any pressure down, you just lightly drag it across the top. Just barely, gentle, like a butterfly kiss. Pulling out all those air bubbles, removing all that texture, and because you're using thinned down paint, all that paint will run back together, level out, and leave a perfectly glass-like surface beautiful. Then once it's dry, we can remove our tape. And I dare you to try and point out which sections are sprayed and which sections are brushed. Now, actually, I, I don't dare you because you watched the video. But anybody that walks into your home isn't going to be able to tell because if you brush right, it still is a nice, perfect, smooth surface. And it makes installation just so stinking easy. All right, enough peel and tape. Let's get on with the video. With our top on and our carcass and face frame all painted, we can start doing the fun stuff, which is getting this whole thing put together. I start by inserting all my shelves and then reinserting all my drawer slides, just hooking them onto those pre-hung brackets on the very back and attaching them to the face frame with just a small set screw. Then it is time to insert our drawer boxes. Now these are just Baltic birch drawer boxes that I wiped down with a light coating of linseed oil just to make them pop a little bit. And I just slide them in place until they click. Then I take all my drawer faces and I remove that piece of tape on the back to determine which drawer goes where. I find the drawer face that lines up with the box. I put my screws through the drawer box until they're just barely sticking out the front like an eighth of an inch. Just enough to really hurt if you stuck your knee against one of them. And then I take my drawer face. Now these already have holes in them because we hung them once. And I line those existing screw holes up with my screws that are sticking out. And I screw them in place. If there's any tension when you're screwing those screws in, it means you missed your hole. So stop. It should go in nice and easy. And then you just repeat on all the other drawers until they are all hung exactly where you left them before we tore this whole thing apart at the beginning of the video. Then after reinserting the glass into my cabinet doors and reinstalling my hinges according to where they needed to go based on how we pre-labeled them, I re-hung, re-hang, re-hang, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, I re-hang all my cabinet doors. 
I should also mention that at some point along here, I added a piece of quarter round trim to the bottom of the cabinet, but apparently I just decided not to film myself doing it. With all my doors and drawer faces hung, I can start installing hardware. Now I am using this hardware jig from True Position Tools. They sent it to me, I was skeptical, but I gotta tell you, it's freaking awesome. It makes installing hardware just super easy because you can set it up exactly where you want the hardware to go and just drill. You don't even have to mark on your cabinet or anything. There's measurements on the jig and bada bada bang, boom, done. Just screw on the hardware. For these drawers, my wife picked this polished nickel pull thingamabob. I don't know, that's above my pay grade. Word of wisdom, if you're building cabinets for your wife, just let her pick out the hardware, okay? That's like her thing, just don't, don't get involved. And then for the top, she wanted these little polished nickel latch things. I don't even know what they're called, but they look kind of nice, kind of old school. And that is it. Believe it or not, it's done. As you can see, when building built-ins, preparation is everything. If you can plan ahead to what your install is gonna be like, you can make the installation process super simple. Remember what it used to look like in here? Way back when, it was just a hole in the wall. And now look at it. A beautiful, functional piece of cabinetry that will elevate the space and eloquentize, eloquentize is an word, um, make it prettier. Boom. Boom indeed. I did it. I made this built-in. And hopefully you got something out of that video and you can go make your own built-in. If you're not doing so already, make sure you subscribe down below and hit that notification button. If you want another way to support me and my channel, then check out the link to my Patreon page in the video description. If you become a patron, you get a whole bunch of different perks like early access to YouTube videos, ad-free, direct access to me to ask all sorts of questions and advice, and a bunch of other great things. So make sure you check out that link in the video description, as well as check out our podcast, Shop Sounds Podcast, where it's me, Nick Keys and KJ Sawdust, and we just talk about nothing but woodworking. So do that and watch some of these other videos.